Welcome to Boat Electrical Made Easy Part 9. This is solar on your boat. There's going to be a bit of science in the beginning of this video. It's quite important that you understand how panels actually work and then you will be able to make an informed decision when you buy your own panels and start fitting them to your boat. So let's dive straight in and get to the basics. The Sun is the star at the centre of our solar system. It is a nearly perfect sphere of hot plasma with an internal conductive motion that generates a magnetic field. It is by far the most important source of energy for life on Earth. Its diameter is about 1.39 million kilometres. That's about 109 times that of the Earth and its mass is about 330,000 times that of the Earth. It accounts for about 99.86% of the total mass of our solar system. Roughly three quarters of the sun's mass consists of hydrogen, around 73%. The rest is mostly helium, with much smaller quantities of heavier elements including oxygen, carbon, neon and iron. At any moment in time the sun puts about 217.5 watts per square metre across the entire Earth's surface when it's facing the sun. Light is what is called an electromagnetic wave, just like radio waves, microwaves, x-ray waves. Electromagnetic waves typically start with an electromagnetic charge that jiggles back and forth. Depending on the frequency of the electromagnetic wave, or how scrunched together the peaks and troughs are, you get different kinds of waves, for example radio waves. They have a pretty low frequency. Next comes microwaves, then infrared light. The next is the visible spectrum, i.e. the different colours that people can see, followed by ultraviolet light, then the waves of higher frequency are called X-rays and still higher gamma rays. Peaks in these are the closest together. You'll sometimes hear that light is made of photons. What that means is that when the light is absorbed or emitted, the energy in the wave comes in lumps. The size of those lumps, or quanta, of energy depends on the frequency. The higher the frequency, the more energy in the photons. So it's important to remember that only about 40% of this energy is actually visible. OK, you're asking, so how do solar panels actually work? Well, when the photon hits a solar cell, they knock electrons loose from their atoms. If the conductors are attached to the positive and negative sides of a cell, it forms an electrical circuit, like the ones we've talked about before. When electrons flow through such a circuit, they generate electricity. Multiple cells make up solar panels, and multiple panels, modules, can be wired together to form a solar array. The more panels you can deploy, the more energy you can expect to generate. So put simply, a solar panel works by allowing photons or particles of light to knock electrons from the atoms, generating a flow of electricity. Solar panels actually comprise of many smaller units called photovoltaic cells. Now photovoltaic cells simply means they convert sunlight to electricity. So to work, photovoltaic cells need to establish an electric field, much like a magnetic field, which occurs due to opposite poles. An electric field occurs when opposite charges are separated. To get this field, manufacturers dope silicone with other materials giving each slice of the sandwich positive or negative charge. Specifically, they seed phosphorus into the top layer of the silicone, which adds extra electrons with a negative charge to that layer. Meanwhile, the bottom layer gets a dope of boron, which results in fewer electrons or a positive charge. This all adds up to an electronic field at the junction between the silicone layers. When a photon of sunlight knocks the electron free, the electric field will push the electron out of the silicone junction. So here's a summary. Number one, you need light to strike the cell to release the electrons. Number two, the cell has positive and negatively enhanced layers. Number three, the cells need to be connected in a circuit. Number four, cells are arranged in groups to form panels. Five, panels are arranged in groups to form an array. Number six, the bigger the array, the more energy you can generate. Different parts of the Earth receive different amounts of solar radiation. This is because the sun's rays strike the Earth's surface most directly at the equator. 
As you move away from the equator, you will notice that different areas also receive different amounts of sunlight, in different seasons for example. Your geographic location on the planet and the season will determine how much energy at peak you can absorb or use from the sun. The amount of energy you can get to your cells will also depend on local factors, mountain ranges or even weather conditions. So let's look at the two types of panel, the types that you're likely to be using. They are monocrystalline and polycrystalline solar panels. Both these types of panel have cells made of silicon wafers. To build up a monocrystalline or polycrystalline panel, wafers are assembled in rows and columns to form a rectangle, covered with glass or plastic sheet and laminated together. So while these both made from silicone, the panels actually vary in their composition. Monocrystalline cells are cut from a single pure crystal of silicone and polycrystalline cells are composed of fragments of silicone crystals that are melted together in a mould before being cut into wafers. Because of this, their efficiency differs. Let's talk about efficiency. Solar panel efficiency is another factor that affects how much energy a particular panel will produce. The efficiency of a panel refers to the ability of the panel to convert sunlight into usable energy. Here's an example. In a panel with 20% efficiency, for instance, 20% of all the light that hits it will be translated into energy. A panel with a higher efficiency rating will convert more sunlight into energy. Most solar panels have an efficiency rating of around 15-18%. to 18%. Well, the ones we're going to be using on a boat anyway. So how do we work out what the efficiency is? Well, there's an international standard for it, but I'll explain. For instance, if a thousand watts per square meter of sunlight hits your boat panels, the amount of sunlight assumed during an STC testing, and your panel is two square meters, you'll end up with 2000 watts. If your panel is advertised at producing 400 watts, you'll end up with an efficiency rating of 20%. Here's the maths. So one of the things which is most important for you to look for is the efficiency rating of your panels so you get the most bang for your buck as it were. Now this table shows the top 10 most efficient solar panels that you can buy on the market in 2020. There's a big difference, 22.6 down to 19.4 and these are all glass domestic panels. OK, let's have a summary. We've looked at two types of makeup of solar panels, monocrystalline and polycrystalline. Monocrystalline are more efficient. Monocrystalline are also darker and made from pure silicone crystals. Efficiency is important. There is a standard way to calculate efficiency. So, you can calculate it or you can read the panel sticker or check the specs for the panel. So what else affects a panel's performance or what you can get from it? Well, there's a few things. There's the angle of the sun as it's hitting the panel, what time of day it is, how hot the panel gets, how clean the panel is, and of course, shadows from rigging or a wind generator, the age of the panel if they're not new, how well the panel's made, fabricated or constructed, surface scratches and damage, the operating voltage of the panel, and also the solar controller that you're going to be using. All of these are important. Let's cover a few of those now. In an ideal situation, your panel would be perpendicular or at 90 degrees to the angle of the sun. It's not always possible on a boat. So at midday on the equator when the sun's directly overhead, that's when you'd get the best performance from your panel. Again, not always possible. The standard test for solar panels is conducted at 25 degrees Celsius or 77F. So if a panel is rated to have a temperature coefficient of minus 0.5% per degree Celsius, that panel's output will decrease by half of a percent for every degree the temperature rises over 25 or 77F. That's a lot. The cleanliness of your panel is paramount to its efficiency. I don't think I need to say any more about that. So some time ago, 
we talked about voltage. Higher voltage means lower resistance, better power transmission. So a higher voltage panel will actually be more efficient than a lower voltage panel if you're using the same controller and the same size cable. And of course there's two types of controller on the market, MPPT or PPT. Whew, that's a lot. Let's stop for a cup of tea for a minute, eh? Oh, you're still there. Okay, someone's going to say, and why did you go through all the science bit? I'm not Einstein, I'm not a rocket scientist, blah, blah, blah. Okay, let me put my tea down a minute. Now, the reason that we do these videos is to educate people, is to try and give them an understanding of what they're dealing with. If you know the science behind something, if you know how it works, you've got a better chance of making your own decisions when it comes to you putting your own solar on your boat. If I just said, you need these panels and you need this charger and just slap them up there, well, it wouldn't be a proper video and it's not my style to give people stuff in that way. I like to explain things, how they work, and give you the opportunity to make your own decisions based on proper science. Okay, I'll finish my tea and we'll get on. Okay, let's look at a few things. Type of panel, location, charge regulator, panel voltage, and how many watts you need. Let's get started. Well, first you've got to design your system. No, hang on a minute. Roll it back. The first things we need to know are the energy use, your battery capacity, and the battery type before you start deciding what panels you're going to use. So the first thing you need to know is how much energy you're going to use in any particular situation. Day sailing, night sailing, day at anchor, or night at anchor. And you need to know how many watt hours you're going to use without adding any power at all from your engine or from your solar. So first you need to find out how many amps each item draws and then how many hours that they're actually going to be running for. For example here, our fridge and freezers only run for about six out of 12 hours. Multiplying the amp hours used by the voltage will give you watt hours, and we always calculate these things in watt hours. Alternatively, if you've got a good quality battery monitor, it will tell you how many watt hours you've used within a 12 hour period. Knowing what you use will give you an idea of how much you need to replace. Does that make sense? Okay, let's do some maths. Let's say we have, or we'll use, 1440 watt hours in a 12 hour day sail. The next thing we need to determine is have we got the battery power to provide this? We've done these calculations before, but let's run through it again. Amp hours times volts equals watts. So, a 100 amp hour battery times 12 volts is 1200 watt hours. If you have four 100 amp batteries, that's four times 100 times 12, or 4,800 watt hours, yes? Well, yes, in theory, however, all lead acid batteries, flooded, sealed, gel, or AGM should never be discharged below 50% of their capacity. Otherwise, you risk damaging the battery. Now, let's do the maths again looking at a 50% discharge rate. So 100 amp hours times 12 volts times 0.5 or 50% gives us 600 watt hours. We've now exceeded our battery capacity. And with four batteries, four 100 amp hours, well that's four times 100 times 12 times 0.5, which is 2,400 watt hours. So with 1440 watt hours for our day sale, that day sale would have already taken us down to 50% of our usable energy from our battery bank. Now let's look at the same calculations for a lithium ion battery. Now lithium ion batteries are slightly different. You can discharge them down to 20 or sometimes 10% of their full capacity. It makes a hell of a difference to the maths. So same maths, 100 amp hours times 12 volts times 0.85 or 85%. That gives us 1,020 watt hours and if we do it with four batteries that gives us 4,800 watt hours. That's a massive change. 
There's also another issue around conventional lead acid batteries. They can only be charged at 10 to 30 percent of their capacity, that's bulk. At 75 or 80 percent capacity, the charge rate has to drop off and they go into absorption. A full charge may take hours of charging on float. Even the best AGM batteries still have their limitations. So you see, it's not just about your solar, it's about your batteries too. But lithium batteries need different controls in their charging. Even if you can charge them at far higher rates, they still have limitations. So the video is up to 15 minutes now and we still haven't looked at the type of panel that's best for you, the location where you're going to put it on your boat, types of charge regulator and controller, panel voltage, how many watts, circuit design, safeguards, fuses, cable sizes, location on your boat, lots to come, all in our next video. We make these videos for you. Please like, subscribe and share. Follow us on Facebook, SVM Pavidus. Comments and questions are always welcome. Sail safe! safe.